Chapter 10 Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls Acorn's shadow. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls Acorn's shadow. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls Acorn's shadow. For thine is the for kingdom. thine is the kingdom. For thine is the for kingdom. thine is this is the way the world this ends. This is the way the world this ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Life is life is very long. Where the chapter ends. Well, shit. Whatever, I'm sure it's fine, Acorn said. He raised one hoof over the book, casting a shadow over it. There, now this chapter title's already out of the way, so we don't need to worry about it. Acorn's shadow, check. So what's the deal? Jean Betancourt asked Acorn. What and how are we judging? Well, Acorn replied, we have two choices, one more extreme and one less. Like I mentioned before, Anna's working on a plan to return this book to normal. We can either help her plan, or we can make it unnecessary. What is this plan of Anna's? Minos said. He swished his tail and was happy to notice that he didn't start shitting. Apparently the absence of Dirk's influence was already starting to make life a bit more bearable. Acorn whinnied and scuffed the ground with his hoof. I don't know. To be honest, I was kind of hoping that she would describe Operation Palimpsest before the book cut back to us so we could read it. Jean Betancourt picked the paper back up and flipped over to the relevant page. She could tell it was the relevant page because it ended with the words, flipped to the relevant page. Maybe the narrative will shift back over to their perspective soon, Jean said hopefully. Yes, Mino said. And maybe that will happen right now. He looked at Betancourt. She shook her head. Mino grumbled. Oh well, Acorn said with an equine shrug which meant he just stood still, because ponies can't fucking shrug. Guess we're flying blind. Unless the narrative shifts back, right? So here's my plan, Anna said. Somewhere, far away, a black cat shouted, Oh, come on! Anna stood on the stump at the edge of the clearing and looked at her two friends like a seasoned general surveying her troops. But in this metaphor, Pam and Pawnee weren't soldiers. No, they were more akin to fighter jets. Vicious, deadly, complex machines made of thousands of delicate parts working precariously in tandem. Filled with rocket fuel and carrying explosive payloads, as dangerous to their targets as they were to themselves. Ripping through the skies at ridiculous speeds, faster than sound, faster than missiles, faster than any thought or intent beyond mere reflex. Full of mazes of crackling electronic wiring and laden with complex meters and dials right next to their controls, so that the slightest change in altitude or bearing is registered in a microsecond long feedback loop, data flickering through them faster than they themselves fly, covered in radar absorbent paint, heat ablating tiles covering their exhaust troughs, equipped with dual afterburning Pratt and Whitney F 119 PW 100 turbofan engines that incorporate pitch axis thrust vectoring nozzles with a range of plus or minus 20 degrees each with a max thrust in the 35,000-pound force, 156 kilonewton class. That's what Pam and Pawnee were like in that moment. Hey, Pawnee, Pam whispered. Or should I call you Lulu now? Anyway, you doing okay after your ego disintegration and resultant existential crisis? Pawnee shrugged. Nah, Pawnee's good, and I'm more or less fine. I've decided to just not think about it too much. Really, is it that much more shocking than all the other shit we've been dealing with today? Yeah, Pam said. If you can accept that you're a fictional character, any other personal revelations must be pretty tame by comparison. She smiled and gave Pawnee a quick hug. Regardless, I'm glad you made it through. Such as the Novgorod Codex, or the Codex Guelphobotanus B, Anna said, unaware that her friends slash troops slash fighter jets weren't listening to her fascinating lecture on the history of palimpsests. Luckily, they tuned in just in time to hear her say, But the underlying text isn't lost forever. It leaves a mark, a trace. Because after all, what is a palimpsest? It's simply a document from which the original writing has been scraped off so that the parchment or vellum can be reused. And that's why Operation Palimpsest is such a clever name for what we're going to do. 
will restore the original document, the trace, by repeating the very process that destroyed it. We're going to scrape off Dirk's text to re-reveal the text underneath it. It's been obscured, but by scraping off the top layer, it will be obscured. Represent the representation. Pam and Pawnee nodded along, pretending for Anna's sake that re-reveal was a phrase that made any sort of sense. The ultimate mechanism is a literal as well as a metaphorical flattening, Anna continued. Literally, in that we want to get rid of these pasted-on pages that are making this book three times thicker than it should be. But more importantly, figuratively. Until now, the center of the structure of this text was outside the structure itself, which is both impossible, and since it's a text, necessary. The opposition between inside and outside is the opposition by which all other oppositions are posed, but writing posits a deposition of this very positional opposition. Writing is external to itself, while also being nothing except the self. It can't be outside the structure because it is the structure, but how can something be described if not from the outside? And with this opposition destabilized, then writing, the signifier, representation, is both something and nothing in and of itself. It's death. Or is it just a presentation of death? A performance of death? Life playing at, on, with, and as death. But that's how it should be, and how it must be. The problem with this text, Dirk's text, isn't that it's exterior to itself. All texts are. The problem is that it's explicitly exterior. And by so clearly identifying an exterior, the center shifts. This treated text is defined by its opposition to the texts that surround it, from which it draws. So the center retreats, withdraws, becomes centralized. Now the center of this structure is inside the structure, which is both exactly where it should be and where it cannot afford to be. The chain of signification is revealed by and to the author, and this revelation transforms it into shackles. To save this text, to return it to what it should be, will therefore need to repeat the original process that writes writing. It's an expulsion, a purification, but inverted. The opposite of the scapegoat, which, in being cast out from the group, defines the group by opposition to it, which is what Dirk's text did. What we need to do is expel the parasite of writing, which is death, from writing in order to define our life. This will return writing, and this text, to what it should never have ceased to be, an accessory, an accident, an excess, which is exactly what makes it, writing, essential, valuable, necessary, but this therapeutic, cathartic elimination must call upon the very thing that it's expelling, which means that the operation must exclude itself from itself, will write out writing and erase erasure. Our flattening will be an ironic one, in the proper sense of the word. We are one, scraping off Dirk's writing, which, two, literally flattens our text. This, in turn, three, reopens it to the possibility of exteriority as such. Four, freeing the center from this structure and unflattening it. Did you get all of that, girls? Yes, yes Pam and Pawnee said in unison. Good. And here's how we do it. More dyslexia shenanigans. Pam, you will guide us to the point where the flattening must occur. In fact, you've already been guiding us there. That's how you knew so much, so many things that you shouldn't have known. It's because, Pam, you are our map. Lead us. Pam shrugged. Sure, okay. Kind of lame, but what else? And Pawnee, Anna continued, you're the key to all of this. You are the one who holds the future of two realities in our hands. Pawnee, Indiana. Lulu Sanders. One a being of this world, one of the world that should have been. Your very identity straddles the two texts. You can fix all this, Pawnee. You will give the world a fresh start by scraping it clean, flattening it and becoming the eve of that new, old world, its progenitor. But instead of eating the fruit, you must refuse it. You must regain your innocence, all of our innocence. You, Pawnee Sanders, are the new ape who re-sands the world. Re-sands? Pawnee asked. Like using sandpaper? A bit of a stretch. Look, said Anna, I did the best I could with what I had. Like I said, palimpsest comes from the Greek palin again, and psao, I scrape. 
scrape again, re-sand. It's good enough. Okay, fine, Pawnee said. Let me see if I can figure out the next one. Anna Harley, your name anagrams to, um, hen a la yarn, because you knit us together, and you make a nest. No, I'm done with the dyslexia thing. I didn't do one for my own name. Oh, Pawnee said, feeling a bit put off. It's okay, Pawnee, Pam whispered. I was going to say they were anagrams. Your thing was smarter than mine. Pawnee smiled, knowing this to be true. Anagrams. Jesus. Well, Pam, Anna said, hopping off the stump. Ready to head out? You know how to get there, right? Pam nodded. Yes, I do. But I don't know where there is. Simple, Anna said, as she picked up her fallen mechanical arm from the snow, looked it over, and tossed it aside. We're going to the end of the book. Jean Betancourt looked up at her two companions. Acorn was staring at the leafy looking pensive while Minos was sulking, tail curled tightly around him at his lack of control over the story's structure. Jean waited for Acorn to speak. He did not. So that's their plan, she eventually said. Not so much a plan as a half-baked English dissertation, Minos grumbled. If so, Betancourt replied, Anna needs to give one hell of a defense. Now what she said makes sense, Acorn said to himself, looking at the river intently. He turned to face the other two judges. It's a physical place, he said, the end of the book that they're heading to. It's literally the final page of that, pointing his hoof at the paperback on Jean's lap, book, right before the back cover, and our job is to clear a path for them. Jean Betancourt immediately flipped to the last page. She squinted at it, held it to the light, trying to see through the paper pasted over it, but it was no use. It was totally obscured. We need to get that off, Acorn said to her. Restore the original text of that one page so the girls can make their changes, resetting the whole book. Minos flopped onto his back in a sunbeam and yawned. Sounds like a straightforward assignment, he said. We just dip that page into the Lethe. I assume that's why you brought us here, yes? In Purgatorio, passing through those waters erased Dante's memories of his sins so that he could enter heaven. And since lately Anna has been developing a rough metaphor in which the altered text is equated to original sin, dunking that page in the river should make the obscuring sheet of paper mm, slough off, dissolve, whatever. Another yawn. An insultingly simple errand. Where does the judging come in? Because we could dip the whole book in, Betancourt said. She turned to Acorn. Right? Acorn nodded. Exactly. Anna's scheme is risky. For one thing, it all hinges on a single choice. We could do everything to set the stage, but one moment of hesitation and it all falls apart. More importantly, I suspect that Anna's planning something she didn't tell me. I bet she'll try to protect herself and the girls from the reset. Try to drag them through to the other side. The other side of the other side of the other side. And if they manage to get through, who knows what else would get through with them, Betancourt finished. So we can either help the girls, knowing that they might fail, or if we decide the book's too dangerous or toxic to allow even the chance of its survival, we can take the choice out of their hands, destroy it ourselves, and with it any slim chance they might have of survival. Theirs would be a soft reset, Minos said. Ours, if we choose to implement it, would be a hard one. Fair enough. Jean Betancourt took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Okay, she said at last. Let's judge this sucker. If you want to read every single word of their argument and slog through all the tedious bullshit, please see Appendix B, Record of the Arbiter's Discussion. Oh, wait, this appendix doesn't exist because nobody wants to read all that bullshit, so here's the highlights. Betancourt began by summarizing the original plot of Detective Pony. They all agreed that it wasn't an artistic triumph, but a kid who liked ponies would probably enjoy it. Minos reminded them of Dirk's earlier argument, that his text was better because it was more interesting, more experimental, more daring. Yes, they decided it was all of those things, but did that make it better? The conversation then meandered into a lengthy discussion of the merits of artistic appropriation. Some tedious, but what is art, really, semantics. The concept of originality entered again. They decided that while originality isn't necessary for art, 
Something original always has the potential to be artistic. Dirk's text was, yes, original. It lay on the border between collage and decollage, and though hardly a human monument, it was still by their definition art, appropriative though it was. Not that this was relevant. Being art didn't make it significantly less worthy of destruction. But it wasn't worthless, was the point. There were a few things that made this a special case, though. The first one being that the three of them were, you know, sentient beings inside this thing. And really, that should overrule all of this. People were being hurt, and they could undo that suffering, artistic though it may be. But they wanted to be more objective. The second unique thing about Dirk's edits was how they interacted with the original text. How nebulous yet sinister and controlling this interaction was. His edits commented on the text from a point of detachment, but in other places acted as if they were the real text. There was something inherently violent about it. Even the physical product was aggressive, covering the original, erasing slash replacing it. And considering that this perverse thing had been a wholesome book for young readers, it was more than a little disturbing. Destroying it would be a loss, they decided. They would be destroying something of value. But the value of what they recovered would be greater, Boom, decided. Now the matter was whether to destroy it themselves or to let Anna try to reset it on her own terms. Acorn estimated that Anna's plan had maybe an 80% chance of success. They agreed, yeah, Anna probably should be the one to destroy it on her own terms. But was it worth the risk? Was the chance that the girls might fail or that Anna might fuck it up with her attempt to live through the reset an acceptable one? Or was it more important that this book was destroyed no matter what? They had their three ideas. Minos gave his verdict first. He was still lying in his sunbeam, swishing his tail idly. Let's just chuck it in the river, he said. It's what we want anyway, and frankly, I'm bored. I enjoyed being mysterious and cryptic and showing up to whisper a riddle and disappear into the dark, but now nothing interesting is happening. This book is a failed experiment, and I'm really not inclined to go through all of it again. Justified the decision with morality or art or ethics or whatever, but we've decided. Now the responsible thing is to follow through. Now it was Jean Betancourt's turn. I think that this text shouldn't exist, she said. Let's begin there. I think it's offensive and crude and not so subtly misogynistic, and most importantly cruel. I defend Dirk's artistic license to do offensive and crude things, but once he realized that these characters were real people... Continuing with his little project and justifying the suffering because it was interesting is unconscionable. That said, I don't think the three of us should destroy the text. Anna, Pam, and Lulu deserve to choose, even if they choose suffering. Depriving them of that would also be cruel. Clear the final page for them, but leave the rest so they may make their own choice. It seems you have the deciding vote, Acorn, Mino said, unsurprisingly. So tell us the third idea. Acorn fidgeted. He did have a third idea, but it wouldn't break the tie. He couldn't bring himself to say it. How could he tell them that he didn't want to change the text at all? That he, selfishly he knew, wanted it to stay this way, even if he agreed it was wrong. But there was one thing that remained constant through all permutations of the story, all trials, all universes. Acorn fucking loved Anna. How could he condone something that would destroy the one thing in this world towards which he felt any hint of emotion? Even if she herself wanted this destruction, he couldn't allow it. No, he wanted to leave the book as it was. He wanted to leave the book as it was? Really? Jean Betancourt said. Acorn snapped out of his internal monologue and looked at the author. She was, of course, holding the book open, reading Acorn's narrated thoughts. Yeah, Acorn said with a petulant whinny. There it is. I pick the third option. The one that fucks over everyone except me and my writer. Hung jury. Not necessarily. What the hell? Jean Betancourt exclaimed, recoiling in shock and revulsion from the book she was holding. Hi, guys. Did you miss me? The three girls, previously the two girls and the town, walked wordlessly through a vast, empty wasteland. There were no landmarks, no sun, no way to establish any direction. But Pam knew where to go and the girls followed. This was the dead land. This was the cactus land, death's other kingdom. 
We'll be there soon, Pam said over her shoulder. Soon. Pam slowed her walk, stopped, and turned to look at Anna. What happens to us when the text reverts to the original, she asked. When we scrape it clean. Anna was silent. Pawnee looked queasy. We're sacrificing ourselves, aren't we? Pam said. That's what you're asking of us. Or at least what you're asking of me. You can probably use your dyslexia powers to ride into the sunset. But what happens to me, myself, if everything's erased? If I had to guess, I'd say that that other Pam and I don't have too much in common. If only one of us was going to live in that other world, I don't think it'd be me. And if that Pam and I, I don't know, blend consciousnesses or some sci-fi bullshit, that's still not me. Let's call it what it is. You're asking me to give up my life so you can restore things to your definition of what should be. Yes, Anna said simply. That's what I'm asking. But it would be a noble sacrifice. Everyone in this world is suffering, she continued, getting more heated, for the sake of cheap jokes. People are hurt. Dozens of people are dead who shouldn't be. And we can fix that. What about the people who aren't dead, Anna? Your father, the firefighter? My mother, the disgraced railroad tycoon who cosplays Mikhail Gorbachev. And yes, as I'm saying that, I realize how ridiculous it is, but is her ridiculous life worth less than this potential other her? I need to sit down for a moment, Pawnee said, sinking to the ground. And what about Pawnee? Pam demanded of Anna. Where does she end up in all this? She doesn't exist at all in the other story. Without this book as it is now, she's fucking dead. You said she'll be the new ape or whatever the fuck ever, but what does that mean? For her as a person, not as a metaphor or a device. It's not that simple, Anna said. We're not erasing the book, remember. We're resetting it. Interesting. And we need a I should have known better than to think that my digression on page 21 could possibly be an inconsequential one-off joke. It all comes back around, always. Pawnee is the pharmacon. She is simultaneously the remedy and the poison, both of this tainted world and that pure one, yet at the same time of neither world. She is a representative of both, represents both, but therefore represents neither, represents nothing but representation. And that's how Anna can use her. In being of the pharmacon, in other words, pharmaceutical, Pawnee is analogous to that other infinitely empty signifier, writing itself. The fact that she herself has written, that she is a part of the very structure she defines slash defies, only makes the analogy more fitting. Under Anna's guidance, Pawnee can turn herself inside out, and consequently turn the text inside out, make the outside retreat inside, and once more restore the inside to the outside. Or, of course, she's just as capable of doing the opposite, of being the poison instead of the remedy. As I said down on page 21, writing itself is a pharmacon, yes, but also a mimesis, an empty, false imitation of speech. A simulacrum of speech's simulation, but Pawnee is wholly original. Despite, or due to, being a combination of two mimetic lies, she becomes something completely new, completely true. Of both worlds, but also of neither. Not a copy of anything. Note, this isn't the same as being a copy of nothing. A facile non-facsimile, an object with no platonic ideal, she is the antithesis of writing. Not at an infinite remove from truth, but something beyond truth. If she plays her cards wrong, i.e. only plays at play instead of putting it into play, she could, instead of turning this text inside out, in fact, turn inside outness itself inside out, which would be, for lack of a better word, not fucking great. And, uh, you're playing a dangerous game, because in using Pawnee as a pharmacon, you're making her a pharmacos. 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 A concept roughly equivalent to a scapegoat. In ancient Greece, a pharmacos was a person who was taken outside the city and executed, sacrificed. Some cities only performed this rite in times of crisis as a catharsis. In Athens, it happened every year on the sixth day of the Targelia, coincidentally, Socrates' birthday. The Greeks believed that the death of the pharmacos would facilitate the purification of the city. By sacralizing the victim, the community was able to turn its violence inside out. This inversion from effect to cause repeated, mimicked, that initial sacrificial turn that enabled the very oppositions of inside slash outside, before slash after, and even cause slash effect itself. In Ritual of the Pharmacos, the city both closed itself to the outside and opened itself. Closed, obviously, by differentiating the other, thus solidifying the self. He was evil, trouble, pestilence incarnate. He is gone now, so we who are still inside the walls are good, safe, prosperous. 
And yet at the same time, it was he, through his expulsion, who allowed the safety to come about. Ergo, he must be honored, venerated. He is sacred, an embodiment of the poison, while simultaneously being the cure that drives out the poison. Sound familiar? And it is precisely this role that Anna is forcing Pawnee to play, Pharmacon, by virtue of being Pharmacos. Does Pawnee know that this is her fate? And if she did, would she agree to it? Now, let's uncover, or should I say discover, another link in the chain of signification. We'll drag Anna herself into this mess. Pawnee, the Pharmacon slash Pharmacos, is also Pharmacia, a nymph who ruled over a poisonous spring. Liquid is the element of the Pharmacon, after all. Pharmacia was the friend of Erethia, who later became the goddess of uh, cold mountain winds. Here is our Anna. Wind, breath. Breath, speech, creation. The Judeo-Christian God bestowed life onto man by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. But even before this, it was his speech that created everything. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God's speech wasn't just incidental, a transmission of the message. No, it was the message itself. Only on the rough lips of man would speech retreat to mimesis. God created the universe with speech. And there's the secret. His first creation, before creation as such, was speech itself. But wait, did God create speech? Or was it the other way around? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Gospel of John seems to conflict with Genesis' account of what happened in the beginning. Here, God doesn't use the Word. The Word uses God. It is the originary Word from which all things flow, including speech, including man, including God. Can we really trust John's Gospel, though? After all, the Gospel isn't the Word of God. It's the words of man. The written words of man. Christ was the Word made flesh, but Adam and his descendants weren't. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Note that God didn't say, Let there be man. No. He spoke to himself, Let us make man. And then he created him. He didn't speak him. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 is so insistent on this distinction that it repeats its assertion to creation, not speaking, thrice, slightly rephrased on each instance. In other words, Genesis denies our claim to divinity, to the word, three times. Preemptive revenge for Peter's inverse folly. Perhaps this is why we cannot speak with the same genetic, genetic consequences as when God speaks, why we are denied the genitive case. Instead, we settled for the much more insidious substitute, the pharmacon of writing. Of course, John would write that in the beginning was the word. He was trying, probably not even consciously, to put himself on par with God. Because what is writing but our attempt to do just that? To create? Consider what was man's first instinct when he had fallen. To reach for a leaf to cover himself. Not a literal leaf, but a figurative one. A fig leaf. Leaf, as in page. When man falls, he immediately clutches onto writing to steady himself and refuses to ever let it go. God intervened and expelled man from Eden for fear that he eat of the fruit of life and become as a god himself, but by then it was already too late. Man had stolen the word, the power to create. Not the word, though, the word. The written word, the inferior warped copy. God spoke the universe into being. Now man, a small g-god, may recreate it by writing it. Not create it again, but change it. Or rather, change his own perception of it. And at last, we circle back to where we started. Pawnee and the Pharmacon. Anna has already explicitly established Pawnee as Eve, implicitly established me as the serpent, and Meta implicitly established herself as God, wind, breath, creation. But as the serpent, I gave Eve words. And since this is a world of written words, who's really more powerful here, God or the serpent? Anna would have Pawnee refuse my gift, which would allow Anna, the word, to be secure in her position as God. Letting her remake the world, rewrite the word in her, capital H, her, own image, if writing is recreation, is rewriting re-recreation? Or does it circle back around to become creation itself, no longer writing, but writing? But what if Pawnee, the unpredictable pharmacon, makes the other choice? What if she reaches for the leaf? And what leaf will it be? The metaphorical leaf of written text, of course, but also it will surely be the leaf of the hemlock, conium maculatum, maculate, spotted, stained, tainted by the pharmacon. The myth goes that the hemlock plant became poisonous because it was growing on the hill where Jesus was crucified. 
When his blood fell on the plant, stained it, it instantly turned toxic. Liquid of the word made flesh transforming the leaf from innocent to poisonous, flipping it on its invisible axis. A maculate conception. But of course, we know that it was toxic long before that. Socrates swallowed a concoction of hemlock when condemned to death by Athens. Hemlock, poison, would have been referred to by the Greeks as a pharmacon, and as such both was and was not the poison that it very much was. But it was also a remedy. Because Socrates was a pharmacos, he, born on the sixth day of the Targelia, the sixth day, when God wordlessly created man, was the sacrifice that purified Athens. The hemlock became a hymn. The poison became a remedy. Conium maculatum became immaculate, miraculous. Through the hemlock, the boundaries of Athens solidified. The hem locked. Yet in this locking, everything was freed. So I, I ask you again, trust you, will Hannah, Pawnee take the God hemlock? But goddammit, I do. Pam sighed, reached a hand down to Pawnee, and helped her to her feet. You've persuaded me. It is worth the risk and the sacrifice. Pawnee, when it comes time, I won't stand in your way. Anna smiled. Thank you. Let's just get going, Pam said. She began walking. The girls followed. They're almost here. We need to act fast. What were they just saying? Jean Betancourt asked desperately. She held the book on her lap while Mino sat on her shoulder, and Acorn stood behind her so all could see it. It seems like it was really important, but you replaced it. Not replaced, exactly. Just uh, drowned it out. It all still happened. You just can't see it. So you don't have real power over the narrative, Minos said. Just the power to troll us. Pretty much, yeah. I lost the ability to speak and to rewrite. All I have now is the power to write, which is next to worthless. It can still be fun, though. Acorn, say something. Fine, Acorn said. F Dirk is a cool guy, and I like his sunglasses. Good. See? All of you heard Acorn's original and rather hurtful if I say so myself words, but as far as this book's concerned, he paid me a compliment. A parlor trick of no consequence, but I find it amusing. And I find it a waste of time, Mino said with a dismissive nose twitch. Yes, exactly. And there's no time to waste. We need to vote on what to do with the book right now, before the girls reach the last page. Anna gave a very convincing argument for her soft reset plan, and we need to stop her. And you didn't think we'd be interested in reading that very convincing argument, Jean Betancourt said to the book? Eh, hey, you'd already reached the same decision anyway. No need to rehash everything. Seems like everyone agrees that we should get rid of the book as it is now. Except you and Acorn. Nah, especially me. I think you misunderstand my intent in speaking to you three. I suppose it's my fault for just showing up out of the blue, or out of the orange as the case may be. I'm here to convince you to undo it all. Destroy the book. Please. Wonderful. Then it's settled, Mino said. He hopped off Jean Betancourt's shoulder, landed beside her, and started swatting at the book with his paw. His vote falls with mine and breaks the tie. Bath time for the book and an end to all this bullshit. Hold the fuck on for one goddamn minute, Acorn neighed. He's not a judge anymore. He doesn't get a vote. That book's going nowhere near the water. You hear me? Minos pranced over to sit in front of Acorn. Says who? Just because he's being judged doesn't mean that he can't be on the bench. Yes, it does, by definition, Acorn whinnied, rearing up on his hind legs. Name one fucking justice system that works that way. One! While Acorn and Minos continued squabbling, Jean leaned down and spoke directly to the page. What does that mean for you, Dirk? Everyone else has some analog in the primary text, some chance of a piece of then surviving. Even me, through the title page but you're not in the original book at all. If we erase it, what happens to you? No fucking clue. Was Anna right with her Minotaur theory? Are you trying to have us kill you as some part of a grand scheme? Will dying in this particular way give you some sort of ridiculous new powers over us? No, she wasn't right. Or at least she wasn't right in asserting that that had been my plan all along. I almost wish it had been. Good connections and callbacks and appropriate illusion. High quality wordplay. I couldn't have done better if I'd written it myself. I'm impressed with her. Proud, even. She's well on her way to becoming an even more formidable manipulator than me. But, no, it wasn't my plan. So why do you want it, then? Jean asked. For once, it's not about me. I genuinely want the book destroyed. Why? Because, look, can you not tell Acorn and Minos what I'm about to say? Betancourt glanced up and saw Acorn thrashing around and generally going nuts, still arguing with Minos, who was somehow clinging on to his mane and managing to shout legal jargon while being tossed about. 
Yeah, I think we'll have our privacy for a while, Jean said. So one author to another. Why do you want to break apart what you worked so hard to build? No, no, not breaking, destroying. Breaking is what I did to your text, and then I rebuilt it from the pieces. I don't want anyone to do that to me. All right, why do you want it destroyed? Because I'm ashamed of it. And ashamed of myself for writing it. <laughs> there, when Anna asked me to be candid earlier, I couldn't do it, and she... But then she trapped me in here, and I reread all of it, lived all of it, and... Fuck, this whole thing, this book is terrible. And it's my fault, and... I can't avoid that anymore. You know how you can get caught up in something and work so hard on it that you never bother to step back and look at the whole, never bother to judge whether you're doing what you set out to do in the first place. Never bother to even figure out why or even if you wanted to do it in the first place. Well, I'm looking at the hole now. I'm in the hole. And holy shit, it's fucked. You mentioned violence a few pages ago, and yeah, that's exactly it. I was violent toward the text, towards your text. I mutilated it. And violence can be creative, but I don't think mine was. Mine was petty and immature, and then I eventually hijacked the whole thing to make it entirely about me. Me, 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 me. That's what the entire second half of the story has been about. I can't resist it, apparently. I'm such a fucking fascinating character that examining every little mope and facet of myself is more important than anyone or anything else. And all my little word games and illusions and theory bullshit are just extensions of that. I'm so important. I'm so interesting. Hell, you only have to flip back like two pages, the entire thing with God and Socrates and Hemlock, blah, blah, blah. Do people want to read that? Doesn't matter. I, I want to say it. Because I think it's clever. And everyone else needs to see how clever I am. So it's going in. I'm so fucking full of myself that I'm overflowing. Little miniature versions of my head are gushing out of my ears, and every time I open my mouth, another me comes crawling out of it, like a cicada molten, leaving behind that gross split-open shell. But in this simile, the shell's alive too, and just keeps making that same awful droning cicada noise on and on and on. But here's the best part. That self-centeredness, it's compounded with self-loathing. So the more I talk about myself, the more I feel guilty, and that gets me off, which means I need to talk about it more just to prove how fucking selfish I am, which gives me further reason to hate myself, and so on. Ad infinitum, ad nauseum. I make myself sick with it. Sick of it. I'm sick, and this book's a testament to that. I can't let Jane see this. That's the bottom line. This was supposed to be a gift. Something about her, but I made it about me. It's masturbation, and she doesn't deserve that. She... Okay, I'm going to stop talking about myself for one goddamn minute now. Jane deserves a better friend than me. Wait, fuck, there it is, within the first sentence. Me. Jane deserves better. She doesn't deserve to slog through all this horseshit. But if she, for some reason, despite my... Fuck, my best efforts does, then she deserves an apology. Jane, I'm sorry. There. See, Anna, there's your genuine connection, and... All anyone has to do to find it is dig through scores of pages of obtuse, aggressive, violent text. That little nugget of emotion is trapped somewhere in there, but I'm always trapped inside things too. Inside the story, inside the labyrinth, and now inside this book that you're holding, which is itself inside the story, an infinite recursion of trapped insideness. But most of all, trapped inside my own head. Maybe that's where this fixation on turning things inside out comes from. From a desire to escape from myself. But it seems like everywhere I turn, I only run into more of myself. So is there an element of self-destruction, of Thanatos, in my desire to destroy the book? Maybe. I don't know. All I'm sure of is that Jane can't read it. So please, Jane, from one author to another, just chuck it in the river. Are you guys having a moment, or what? Jean started at Acorn's voice. Oh, no. Dirk was just explaining himself to me. She looked at the pony and the cat, calmly standing next to each other. So what's up with you two? Have you come to an agreement? In a way, Minos said. We're leaving, Acorn said bluntly. You know where we stand on the issue, Jean, and arguing more won't change our minds. Whatever you and Dirk decide should happen to the book, go ahead and do it. Our role is done. Where will you go? Jean Betancourt said quietly. To find Anna, Acorn said. That's all that's ever mattered to me, and you know that. I have no idea how I'll find her, or even what she'll be like if I do, but I need to be with her. However it goes down, I want to be by her side. And I don't know where I'm going, said Minos. Like I said, I'm done here. This world isn't for me. I'm a cat. I'm not a deity, not a judge, not a king. A cat. Let me be a cat. With those words, Minos pranced down to the banks of the river. 
When he reached the edge of that transparent, transcendent, infinitely cold water, he paused for just a moment, flicked his tail, lowered his head, and drank. A black cat with white paws stood at the edge of a river. It looked around uncertainly and mewed softly. Something behind it made a noise. It turned around and saw two large creatures nearby. The black cat with white paws arched its back, hissed, and scampered away. Goodbye, Minos, Acorn said. And goodbye, Jean. With that, Acorn took off, galloping through the meadow, searching for the girl he loved. Goodbye, my friends. Acorn, may you be reunited with she whom you seek. Cat, may you lose he whom you were. Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.